Sup, freaks. It's your boy Marty here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I had the immense pleasure of sitting down with Alex Bosworth, head of infrastructure at Lightning Labs, who's somebody who's been working on the Lightning Network and uh, teaching individuals how to successfully run a routing node on the Lightning Network for some time now. Uh, this episode, frankly, was a long time coming. I can't believe it took me uh, this long into TFTC's life to get Alex on the podcast, but I'm very happy I did. Shout out to Desiree Dick- Dickerson for putting this together. Um, we had a great conversation covering everything Lightning, what's going on, uh, what needs to be done, uh, and and how the network has grown to date and may grow moving forward. This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by our good friends at the Cash App. They'll help you do many things, including stack sats. You can send sats, receive sats, and sell sats if you have to. Um, what I'm really liking is that they've made sats to standard, really uh, helping eliminate that unit bias out there. Uh, we're buying millions of sats at a time, tens of thousands of sats at a time, hundreds of thousands of sats at a time. Uh, makes it seem like you, you're, you're, you're getting more bang for your buck. Um, on top of that, they have cash app investing. All right. If you want to stack slivers of stonks, a lot of people are stacking slivers of stonks right now. Stonk market is going absolutely crazy. I don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, but if you want to get in on that stonk, stonk market insanity, uh, Cash App Investing is letting you do that. And if your favorite stonk is a little too expensive in this recent run up, uh, don't worry. You can buy as little as $1 of your favorite stonk. Okay. Uh, because Cash App is directly connected to your bank account, there's no four to five day waiting periods to start investing today. And guess what? Cash App may even be your bank account now. If you didn't notice, they're giving out accounting and routing numbers so you can get direct deposits into the Cash App. They're becoming a new bank, a bank where you can stack sats, stack slivers of stonks, participate in their boost program, which helps you save at partner merchants. Uh, you get a little personalized debit card, your signature on it, a little Bitcoin on it, whatever you want to put on there. You go to Partner Merchants, you activate a boost, you save some money. Then you can take that and stack st- sacks. Who? almost said snocks. Sats. All right. Uh, if you have not downloaded the Cash App yet and you are going to do that, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's S T A C K I N G S A T S, one word. You're going to get $10, and $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. <laughs> <laughs> That's Owls Lacrosse. That dirtbag Al is back at it again. He responded to uh, the restraining order idea that I threw out on the Will Cole episode. And he's very, very uh, combative about this. So he, he, he's scaring me, freaks. Uh, he's talking about his inchworm on Twitter. This guy is dangerous. So stay away from him. Download the Cash App and enjoy this episode with Alex Bosworth. Take care. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here uh, on a lovely Tuesday afternoon where I am. And it's early afternoon where you are, where my guest is, uh, day after Memorial Day. Excited about this conversation. We're going to get a huge breakdown on everything that's going on on the Lightning Network. It's a, a something that I use every day, whether I'm receiving or sending transactions. And I think it is the Lightning Network particularly is something that is vastly underestimated at the moment. So I'm very excited to be sitting down with Alex Bosworth, uh, Lightning Infrastructure Lead at Lightning Labs. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's great to talk to you. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, again, very excited for this conversation. Before we get into the nitty gritty of everything that's going on uh, on the Lightning Network layer, how did you get to building on Bitcoin and, and Lightning specifically? Um, I think I first started working in the Bitcoin space in uh, around 2016 when I participated in this program from Chaincode Labs 
um, which was uh, then called the, the hacker residency. And that was an idea that Matt Corallo had where they would bring in people who are interested in working on Bitcoin and then they would have uh, Bitcoin core developers kind of take people through how the process of developing Bitcoin core worked and the philosophy of Bitcoin. And that was a one month kind of program. Um, and it just so happened that the timing worked out. I was in New York at the time and uh, there was a, a few other people who participated in the program with me. Um, it was a really great, great program and I got like a, a, a an overview of Bitcoin, Bitcoin core, how it, you know, how everything is working. And from there, um, you know, I, I'd always been kind of like an enthusiast in Bitcoin. I just hadn't really worked in it. Um, so uh, at that point, um, I had connected with uh, this company, BitGo, in Palo Alto. And um, they, they were, uh, at the time, like this Bitcoin API platform for um, like Kraken, Bitstamp, the exchanges, and they kind of do the back end Bitcoin uh, indexing and things like that for them. And uh, they were looking for people, and um, I connected with them, and then I, I went to work at, at Bitco. Um, so uh, when when I was working there, I worked on a kind of a, a derivative of the of the Bitcoin blockchain, which was kind of like a private blockchain project for um, transferring um, gold tokens. But it was actually just like a fork of the Bitcoin protocol. Um, so that's that really helped me like get. Um, deep into like how the, the actual Bitcoin protocol works um, by creating this like uh, private blockchain. Um, and then at, when I was working at BitGo, so this is, you know, more into 2017, we started to see like um, a big rise in like, you know, the price of Bitcoin. And also just like, there was just a, you know, a huge explosion in the space. And um, we also hit, you know, issues with the mempool. So um, when I was working at Bitco, we, one thing we noticed is that like customers were paying huge amounts in, in chain fees because the people who are using the mempool the most um, are the exchanges, like they're paying for those fees. So um, uh, I'd already like shipped the uh, private blockchain project um, and uh, I was looking for what to work on next. And um, we were thinking, okay, what if we could use Lightning Network to help reduce the, the, um, the fees that uh, the, the exchanges are paying because it's it's really a large large amounts and you know we we just had kind of a fee fee bump recently where where fees were going up to maybe a few dollars per transaction but in those days you know we were starting to see like thirty dollars per transaction so that was there was a lot of pressure to figure out like how can we make lightning into a workable solution that exchanges can deploy um, and uh, I was working at at, at, lightning, at I was working at Bitco and then I um, I decided to leave Bitco and really focus on, on a, a concept um, of bridging people onto the Lightning Network, um, and that's called submarine swaps. Um, so I came up with this concept to um, allow kind of like uh, people who are not necessarily already on Lightning to get onto Lightning um, from the chain in a way that uh, is non-custodial, like an atomic swap. Um, and uh, I created the concept as like an open source project so anybody could run it and I ran it myself. Um, and uh, it kind of allowed access to the Lightning Network even if you didn't have any Lightning Network software. Um, that, so just like the bare minimum of what you would need to go from one system to the other system. Um, and then it also started working on this idea that you could go the other way too. So you could go from the Lightning Network back onto the blockchain. Um, and I did some presentations about this and I released this software um, and Lightning Labs um, after a while came, called me up and they said, you know, we're uh, kind of expanding um, and we're looking for somebody to, you know, help us build out our, our products. And um, I joined Lightning Labs and um, it, Lightning Labs was also interested in the same kind of submarine swap concept. Um, so um, I worked with them on this project called Lightning Loop. And Lightning Loop is the, the same kind of concept, the submarine swaps um, that uh, we offer as a, as a product. Um, and then at Lightning Labs, I also help out with other um, Lightning, Lightning projects, like trying to kickstart this whole network because like, you know, it's still a small network. We really need to get more adoption. We, we need to get more integrations. And um, there's a lot of integration work that has to happen for that. Fascinating journey. And before we get into Loop, that's one thing I want to touch on, like the state of the Lightning Network. As somebody who uses it every day, again, I think it's very underutilized. Uh, I recently put up a couple ads on Bitcoin Bounty Hunters, that that uh, first-player shooter game 
that recently came out and allows you to use the Lightning Network to uh, pay for billboards within the game. And I showed my cousin yesterday an example of how I could just get an ad in this video game for less than a cent if I wanted to. I just put like a thousand sats on there. It's not less than a cent. I don't know what that converts to right now, but uh, whatever that is, very cheaply. Get it's like 10 cents, yeah. Yeah, get a, get a billboard ad on this video game and it blew his mind. Like I, I just created an invoice on the website, funded my ad via, via, um, zap, which is the wallet I use. And, um, it was up there. My cousin was like, are you kidding me? You can like buy billboard ads in this video game. That's mind blowing. And so it seems like to me, at least as a user, the utility is, is massive, but it seems like people are sleeping on lightning. Uh, you hear a lot of FUD from the Ethereum crowd that there's more Bitcoin locked on, on like wrap BTC than there is on Lightning Network. Uh, why do you think Lightning at this point has the adoption that it does, whether yeah. it be too yeah. little or, or pacing where it should be? Well, I think it's a fun- it is a function of the, t- of the total amount. So w- what you kind of need is for there to be like a critical mass of people to address. So like, if you wanted to sell an ad, you need enough people to to buy the ad and you have enough, need enough people who are consuming the ad. So um, right now you can make really cool concepts, right? Because like, you can kind of show the promise. What if everybody could buy these ads for, you know, a penny and you didn't need to put down your credit card or anything. Um, Like I'm on this Telegram bot and all the Telegram bot does is like spam me with messages. And so uh, anybody can kind of like bid to spam other people. And every time I get the spam, I get like two Satoshis or something. And you can kind of set, set your threshold, like how much is your attention worth to you? Um, and it, you know, it's, it's a cool project that somebody can make up, but in order to bring it to scale, you need to have a bunch of users. Like, because I think the number of people who are on the Telegram bot, it's like 500 people. So um, I, I, I'd say like right now we're, we're, we're still in the, in the concept phase and um, you know, it's, it's anyone's guess, like what will be the killer app. Um, and that's it, just hard work of like getting people to um, growing the audience and um, figuring out where lightning is sol- solving the most problems. Yeah. And how much does protocol maturity come into this? Like how, how mature is the protocol right now? Is, yeah. is there, yeah. there's st- still a long way to go from a networking would- perspective, correct? <laughs> I would say that protocol maturity, that's like where everything starts. Um, so like how sound is a protocol? Um, how much does it define? Does it define everything? Um, so I would say that is still a work in progress. So there will be like a couple major overhauls. Um, the, the, the recent overhaul that's being discussed is um, this idea of anchor outputs. And um, that's kind of addressing a addressing a problem with uh, uh, lightning channels where they're not very um, adjustable to fee market changes. Because every every time you you have a payment channel, you have to kind of like pre-consider what the on-chain fees are gonna be because the state of the channel changes be, like as the balance moves around. But then you need to figure out like who is supposed to pay the fee and how much is this fee gonna be? And then um, the fee market changes. So now you have to renegotiate. And what happens if they go offline? Now you can't renegotiate. So maybe you have to go to the chain. It's, it's really a, um, kind of a problem for the pro- at the protocol level. Um, so the most recent version of LND actually has this experimental new channel type. It's uh, like a new, pro- new protocol. Um, it's a, not a standard, but it's, a, it's um, potentially going to be a standard. And uh, in that, it uses this thing called anchor channels that will allow you to adjust the fees after the fact using child pays for parent. And this is also going to be um, using kind of like this, these uh, changes in Bitcoins, like uh, relaying and mining protocol that will allow you to, the miners and the relayers to kind of consider a package of transactions together, how much fees are those generating? Um, and that will help us like make a more sustainable um, protocol that's like more reliable. We can kind of predict what's going to happen because we have control over the, over the fees, even if the other person goes away. And it's also going to impact the liquidity of the market because right now an issue is you create a channel with somebody else and um, maybe in the future you decide that your 
the, the peer that you created the channel with, somebody random on the network, they decide to close the channel. Um, so who pays those fees? Well, it's actually uh, you paying the fees because you created the channel. So that's kind of like how it's supposed to work out to be fair. But the other side of the, the, your peer could, could do it in a way that's like gonna be annoying to you. Like maybe your peer it sees, oh wait, I have some money on my side. I want it really fast. So I'll pay the top dollar fees. Like if the fees went super high, like $30, they would have just cost you $30 because they wanted their money quick. Um, so with anchor outputs, it's gonna be flipped. So the way that it's gonna work is that whoever wants it fast, they're gonna pay for that extra speed. And by default, it will just be at the slowest level. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a big protocol change that requires a lot of re-architecting of things. And um, I think that will come in the near term. And then the long term, there's maybe even new kind of concepts like after Schnorr and Taproot. Uh, maybe L2, like there's other soft forks that, that could uh, allow for different types of channels. Um, but the, 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 I would say like right now, as far as uh, adoption goes, like the anchor channels are kind of like the, the, the biggest step forward as, as far as like making, improving the security and reliability, uh, predictability of uh, payment channels. And the rest of the thing that's uh, causing like hindering of adoption is just engineering work. So we need to make sure that the implementations are rock solid. Like you're putting your Bitcoins in here. If you're putting a million dollars in something, you, you, you better make sure that that's been audited and um, that has a lot of great guarantees for you. And uh, that in, it involves building a lot of features to, to, to make that, make you feel good about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is a, a relatively new protocol. How old is it? Less, a little over two years old now at this point. Yeah, well, and it's definitely been evolving. Like the original white paper has has you know is is totally different from how it, how it's come out, and there there's even you know different protocol implementations, um, and it, it will change. It will change a lot as it goes forward. Yeah, and I mean, how hard is it building the second layer as as Bitcoin at the protocol layer is changing too? Like you mentioned, L two, uh, that could be enabled if Schnorr gets enabled, correct? And well, it's a separate it's a separate soft fork um, yeah. potentially, um, but as things are seem like they're currently envisioned, um, it would be a separate soft fork. So it's a whole new kind of can of worms, really. Um, Schnorr and Taproot will have their own implications on the Lightning channels. Um, I would say it's it's actually nice, in my perspective, that the Bitcoin protocol is slow moving. Um, if you're thinking about like getting your your software obsoleted or you know having breaking changes coming along because there's like lightning is already pretty fast paced moving. So if you also had to think, Oh, well, the Bitcoin protocol is, un is changing underneath our feet. Um, then we need to like be recreating channels or, you know, dealing with changes to the protocol. So, um, I'd say Bitcoin, it, it has a, the, the good aspect that it's like, okay, I know that what's here today is going to be there tomorrow. Yeah. And that's correct. I got that confused a little bit l2 would be a different soft fork and what what would that change particularly at the protocol level um what would that change at the protocol level um it would kind of like at, in the lightning protocol it would it would kind of change how um it would change how the, the states are kind of folded up so like um it would change it would change to more of like a, a counter model so right now we have this, this model, which is like a, a secret model. And whenever you make a payment channel that's bi-directional, you wanna have some way to say that the old state that I, that I previously countersigned to, I want that to go away. I don't, want, I don't want you to use an old state anymore. And so the, the, the model that is currently used in the Lightning Network is that um, w the way that we prove that we're not going to use this old state and that it's dead is that we reveal a secret. And the secret allows um, unilateral spending of funding if um, the other side goes to the chain and they should not they should if they use it an out of date state. Um, and it's a very harsh protocol because if you ever if you ever try to cheat the other side, then you can take all the money. Um, and so like the criticism has kind of been like, this is so harsh. What if people like do it by accident? Um, and then L2 has a different model. It's a different type of protocol where it's based on kind of like this counter system. So the counter system is um, every time we commit to a state of the payment channel, we're going to increment a number. And so there's going to be state one and there's going to be state two, state three, state four. 
And if you go to the chain with the out of date state number, um, I can, I'll, I'll still have a period of time when I can challenge it. And all I really have to do to challenge it and, to, and, and override it is to present a higher state number. Um, and that way you can kind of say, well, it, it's, not so, it's not so harsh to, to use an out of date state because the worst that happens is the other side just corrects you. Um, and uh, that, you know, is um, possible through a soft fork that's changing like how the, um, how the signatures like validate, right? How like you are, um, like it's introducing a new way that scripts can execute. Yeah. Yeah, that's the very controversial part is uh, should we be soft working stuff at the protocol level for Lightning? Is that set a weird precedent? But that does seem like it would create a much better UX on the, on the Lightning network. Well, and, and I think the research is still out in terms of like, there's there's lots of different ways that Lightning can be done. So, um, and the, the to change, making a consensus rule, that's like really something there's no undo button on. So you better make sure that it's super necessary and it has, you know, great results. And, you know, uh, it's not 100% um, like known that this is actually even a huge problem of this, like um, this breaching is a problem because right now, like, um, I, I have a node that I set up for y'alls that's on tour. It's been running for a year plus. Nobody's ever tried to breach me. Um, that and the 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 way that you in order to to do this accidental breach you would also have to be like um you would also have to like ignore lots of other safety safety precautions that, that are built into L and D. Um and like in practice it doesn't seem to be a huge problem. And the reverse might might actually work out to be true if you remove the penalty. Because if you remove the penalty for trying to cheat somebody, um well, maybe they're going to try it more. So maybe you have to think like if there's a million dollar channel and they could try to cheat you and then just hope that you don't get it in, but there's nothing that they have to lose and they can win a million dollars. Like maybe that's not as secure as, as a, as a, um, as a model that we currently have. Yeah. That is interesting to think of. Like, even though it's possible now people aren't, aren't, aren't really executing those attacks. Um, Right, right. I mean, and it would be very interesting if they started to execute them because you would kind of have like people playing dead and they'd be like, oh, I'm vulnerable to an attack at, in order. But then they would try to like um, have the other person put their money up at stake and then try to steal the money. But then they would actually execute the justice transaction and take money back. Um, there's a lot of like theoretically interesting things that could happen. It's just that they, they aren't really. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fascinating. It'll be it'll be interesting to see how and if these attacks are executed, if if more adoption comes. Um, but like back on the, the topic of adoption and and like the killer apps that will bring it, like something like LSAT, where it, it fixes the the four hundred two error that exists on on the uh, on the internet right now, or LNURL auth. These applications seem pretty groundbreaking and paradigm shifting when you think about how individuals interact with the internet particularly and really sort of shifts the the dynamic of power between uh, people and the websites they interact with it seems yeah for sure um like I, that's one thing i played around with when i did like uh when i made yalls.org um i i was like uh what if we had this um and you also org like you don't see it, but it has like a 402 error. That's like you need to pay you need to pay some money. And um, I thought it, it just makes so much difference that you can um, have micro incentives. Um, like one thing I really don't have to deal a lot with is spam, because you know if you go to a web if you set up a bulletin board normally, um, well anybody can access it from their website and basically you know, whoever is caring the most about annoying you is going to like hit the form and spam you or, you know, maybe put some ads up or whatever, grief people. But once it starts costing them money to do that, they're not doing it. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's like a larger lesson that can be applied to, to protocol, like in general, like, um, we had all these peer to peer protocols. Like when I was a kid, there was like, that was an era of Napster and stuff. And I was like, Oh my God, Napster is like so groundbreaking. Um, but what, what, pe what you know, of course, there was like a legal challenge to Napster, but then when people tried to make decentralized versions, they were like, 
while everybody was just like stealing and or posting garbage and like there was no feedback mechanism but potentially like bitcoin and micropayments can enter into peer-to-peer -peer protocols to give feedback mechanisms so people like cooperate yeah i think i mean again i think people are sleeping on the lightning network like the way it can and change the dynamic on the internet just via creating little mini paywalls that, that like you said dissuade attackers from and spammers from spamming uh use cases and then on top of that like using a lightning node as uh quasi identity across the internet too seems seems very interesting especially when you get into the whole concept of uh something like lnurl auth or i believe you could even probably leverage LSAT for this is just using uh, your node as a way to access websites and services instead of having your username and password stored on on their databases you could store it on your node and give it out at will as you go around the internet which seems like a much safer way to me at least off the top of my head yeah for sure like um, and it's not even really your node like the identity is coming from your seed like your the seed phrase that you wrote down. So like imagine if all of your passwords for all of your websites could just be derived from a, from a seed phrase. Um, that would be so awesome. Um, and it's also a seed phrase that you're kind of like already incentivized to keep that safe, keep that backed up. So you have just have this one thing that not only is your money, but it's also kind of like all of your identities or like maybe virtual properties, that kind of thing. Um, so that, yeah, that's definitely only one thing I think is really cool is getting people onto like this asymmetric cryptography um, that allows you to, you know, it feels archaic that we have to like remember some password or like choose the right password thing. Um, what if you just have like one central kind of authenticator thing that like um, you just record, write this down on paper and then it works across it, across your sites. And, and there's another interesting thing also about the Lightning Network, which is we have kind of like this um, set of channels. So people actually are kind of creating these relationships. And um, that's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, harkens back to this idea of web of trust, where, you know, we didn't invent like public key cryptography. And back in the day, you know, everybody was trying to like get everybody into this like public key signed web of trust. So you could know like, okay, this guy vouches for this guy and this that guy vouches for that guy. Like uh, when I was like first buying Bitcoin, I went to this like IRC chat room, which is, which is like, um, which had this web of trust website kind of, and so you could kind of rate other people you were buying Bitcoin from because like that was the, the days when like Mt. Gox was like seemed pretty sketchy or wasn't even around. And um, people were like trying to create this grassroots kind of connections. Um, but the Lightning Network actually has that like inherent into it because you're creating channels with people. Then these are like long lived connections. These are people helping you out like over a year. So potentially we can use those kind of like trust connections um, or, you know, you know, like I have at least a history with you. You're not just somebody randomly coming to me. And I can also analyze who you are connected to and who they are connected to. Um, I think that, that could be something pretty cool could be leveraged in the future. Yeah. A lot of people like to point to the channels and the connectivity to channels and say, uh, you should be getting sort of Sybil attacked by authorities who are looking to track you around the lightning network, but very few focus on this, uh, this aspect of it where you could create like a reputation market with people that you're connected to and, and the good actors who are using it in, uh, in a way that it's meant to be used uh, not tracking everybody. Uh, again, there could be vast benefits that come from that. And that's a big question. Like does the game theory play out? Like are these attackers going to want to put up the cost for that? Cause you do have to lock Bitcoin in these channels for an extended period of time and you have to have that capital in the first place so and you have to be like an active participant so it's you know it's not just like you you spin up a node and now you become a good router like you actually have to help people you have to work with them so it's almost like a community yeah well that's a good point you bring up being a router as something you've been tweeting a lot about and documenting a lot is the experience uh being a routing node and and how to do that profitably what what can you tell us today about that experience is it doesn't seem very easy right now. It is, it is a job, but if you do it, uh, it seems like it could be profitable in the future. Yeah. I mean, I would say that it's, um, 
it's 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 fun like that's that's a, that's a, the high level point i would make about routing it's like it's so cool like i'm participating in hundreds of like online transactions every day with with random people throughout the world like how cool is that like i can just go every day back and i can say okay i was part of 100 100 transactions um like with bitcoin on chain that's like you know maybe i'd make one purchase every once in a while um but now i'm doing it all the time every hour so um it, in terms of incentivizing routing nodes i do think that is important like beyond just like altruism and you know trying to help the network um and that's something i do work on um in terms of i try to set up my nodes so that they are going to earn routing fees and um, to see how I can make it so that this is a sustainable system that like as the network scales up that routing nodes um, have monetary incentives to expand themselves to help scale. Um, and so I, I, I noticed that um, there's there's a lot of people who like try to set up routing nodes and they they fail because it, it's an involved process. It's not just you turn on your node and then you're 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 forwarding. Um, and it's, it's a lot, it, I mean, even a Bitcoin node, if you just like run a normal Bitcoin node and you want to help the network, um, most of the times you wouldn't really be helping the network because you're probably, the network, you know, probably doesn't need you. Um, so really you're, 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 you're maybe helping in a very marginal way. Um, and if, even if you're a pro, at, but, but if you're like, if you're relatively decent at setting up um, infrastructure, um, you could set up like a, a nice Bitcoin node that would be a relay node and it would allow out incoming connections and it would be expanded and it would be relaying tons of Bitcoin transactions around. You wouldn't really need to touch it. But a routing node is different because you need to be managing liquidity. You need, you're kind of like a trader. You're, you're figuring out where should I put my place, my capital and where am I going to get returns and returns means like where, where do people want to be sending money? And if you place money where people are not wanting to be sending money, well, then you're not, you're not really helping anybody. So um, that's like the whole process that I'm like in, involved in is like, how does that work? And so how do you scale a routing node and, and what are the limitations? Like, is there a level at which uh, you may have too many channels and you sort of need to uh, weigh the opportunity cost of opening a channel with an, one node over another? Uh, how much, how many sats are you putting in these channels? Or do you try to put yeah. as many as possible um, um, at, at the onset? And Yeah, scale there's, from there? there's endless questions really about like how to, how to operate these routing nodes. Um, as far as how much money, well, okay, why would you not want to create uh, just a bajillion channels? And that's that's a strategy, right? This is kind of like a game. Like, uh, there's no set answer here. It's like a market. We have to like figure out what the best answer is, and we're competing against each other for these routing. Um, so the, the the reason I would say that like you wouldn't want to create a ton of channels is because um, of the balancing liquidity issue. So whenever you create a channel, all of the balance starts out on your side because you wouldn't want to have uh, a network where people could just like demand other people lock out of them. So all of the balance is starting on your side. So if you make a hundred channels, that means that there's a hundred channels now on your node where the balance is all on your side. And what routing is doing is it's saying, I have um, somebody else has pointed some capital at me and I pointed some capital at somebody else so I'm going to reduce the capital that somebody else pointed at me, and I'm going to um, reduce the capital that I pointed at somebody else, and that's a, that's routing. I'm, I'm passing the money from one hand to the other hand. Um, but if you just open up 100 channels, then all the money is in your hands. There's no money in other people's hands that's pointed at you. Um, and so you can't route. It's impossible. And what's, what's more is that in Lightning, we don't advertise the fact that balances are on our side or on the other side because of privacy. We want to make sure that like balances are kind of invisible. And even in, uh, in terms of scalability, it, it would be infeasible to advertise constantly everybody's balance to everybody else. That just wouldn't scale. So um, when people encounter your node, they, they, when people try to route a payment, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're like uh, mapping the network. They're, they're trying to figure out like which path can my payment take? And so when they hit your node, what could happen if you've created these hundred channels is that they try each one, they try to get into your node and they, they're like, okay, I want to, I want to use this, this guy as a router, but then nobody's assigned capital to you. So every time they try one of your channels, it doesn't work to go into you because all the money's on your side. So L and D has actually added a feature, which will, after a while, it will give up on you. And it will say like, this person has just got too many channels. 
who that are t that the mo the money is imbalanced. So like um, I'm going to give up even trying the, uh, the other ones, um, and so you're going to be like losing out as a router. So that, that's kind of like pushing back on you from just like creating tons of unbalanced channels. Um, and there is something that you can do to balance channels, which is you can get other people to open up to you. Um, and then there's also like liquidity services like Lightning Loop that, um, you know, that I'm working on, which basically allows you to um, pay out off, ch off chain and then receive the money back on chain in an atomic way. And what that's, what that's helping you to do is to get the money um, kind of moved between the channel um, so that you can both rescind and receive. And so you don't need the other person on the other side of that channel to open up another channel with you. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's kind of the terms of the deal. Like, if you open up a channel with somebody and they accept the channel, then the deal is that you're allowed to spend down that channel, and then the funds that you do that you spend down on that channel, they can be used to receive by you in the future. Yeah. So let's dive more in the loop. How long you've been working on this? What's the the state of loop, and and uh, what can we expect it to be more uh, commonplace between light, Lightning users? Um, yeah, I started working on loop. I mean, I guess I started working on the concept before I even joined Lightning Labs. And then when I joined Lightning Labs, um, that was kind of like the first thing that I started working on. Um, but I kind of switched more from the developer side to like the PM side. And um, the, the, the big takeaway that I had when I joined Lightning Labs is like, what people really want out of these swaps is they want to go, they want inbound liquidity. They want to go from Lightning and move that funds out onto the chain. And not only because of inbound liquidity allows them to receive, like a merchant would want it because they would be wanting to receive, but it would all, it's also a way to kind of reduce the amount of funds that you have to keep in your Lightning wallet. Because like if you're receiving a lot of, a lot of funds on Lightning, like if you're, if you're uh, selling gift cards or something, like funds are always stacking up, stacking up on your hot wallet. And you, you want to get that out. You want to you get that money out. So, um, but you don't want to like mess up the channels that have been created. Like those channels have delivered a lot of sales to you. Those are good channels that your customers are using. So Lightning Loop allows you to um, kind of reduce, clean out like your cash register. So your cash register kind of fills up and you've got all the money that's come over to your side on the Lightning, on the Lightning Network. And then you can just move that out um, onto the chain. Um, so we, we, we release that and I guess Loop's a year old now. Um, and the big thing that we've been like working on for like loop two or like the future of loop is um, the interesting thing about loop is that actually it's a, it's, it's also a scalability solution for on-chain transactions. Um, and it's a scalability and privacy solution because um, one thing that we can do with all of these loops that are happening is that we can batch them together into, into major batches and batching is a, is, you know, there's SegWit, you can always upgrade your, your on-chain sense to SegWit, and, you know, you can save half of your fees. But if you are upgrade to batching, it can be even more savings. It can be like up to maybe 5x savings. So you can pay five times less for your on-chain fees. Um, and, but the problem with batching is that normally when you try to do, a, the only people who can do batch sends are people who have enough volume to justify doing batch sends. And even they have to kind of wait a while. So like an exchange is going to say, wait an hour, and then we'll batch together all the withdrawals and we'll send them all, all out to the people and we'll save on chain fees by batching together all of those withdrawals. But you as just a random person, you, you don't have enough volume to justify doing batching. Uh, maybe, if you, maybe you could just like save up all the on-chain things you want to do for the weekend or something and then send them out as one transaction. But you, you can't really realize those massive savings of making these mega transactions. But the interesting thing with Lightning Loop is that um, it allows you access to our batch transactions in a way that's non-custodial. So this can be kind of built into wallets um, because it's an open source service that just anybody can use. Yeah, and it, you're sort of seeing that already, right? Like Ride the Lightning has it integrated. Uh, yeah, for sure. So. Yeah, um, they, uh, you know, there's certain integrations that are kind of like private integrations. Um, I think, um, you know, services like gift card sellers and things like that are, are using Lightning Loop, which is really only available as an API and a command line process. So it's not something that you can just go download right now. Um, we haven't, I mean, that's another thing that I think that we'd like to improve upon is to just make Lightning Loop into a product that you could just like try out. But right now we've really focused on just making it into an API that other, th other wallets, other people could integrate. And um, 
yeah, so Ride the Lightning is probably the easiest way to just download something and you can use Loop right away. Yeah. No, I mean, the UX that they're building, that Suheb uh, and team are building over there at Ride the Lightning, it makes it really easy in visualizing it. Zach's yeah. implemented this as well, too, right? Because you can slide, or at least I know Jack's thought about implementing it, just slide. And visually, you can just slide to rebalance your channel, and that makes the UX so much better. Yeah, for sure. And it, it also, like, uh, Loop works well, I think, with circular rebalancing, which is another feature that RTL just added. And circular rebalancing is kind of like, I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, liquidity on one channel, and now I want to shift it over. I want to spread it out between my other channels um, so that they're all nice and balanced. Um, but the problem with circular rebalancing is that you can't increase the amount of inbound liquidity that you have. So you can't increase the amount of around. Um, so you need like an external service um, to say, okay, I'm going to assign, I'm going to move funds, um, move more funds pointed in your direction. And Lightning Loop also isn't the only way to do that. Like uh, on yalls.org, I actually just like sell channel open attempts. So, you know, uh, you just come to yalls.org and you like say, I need a channel. I need some inbound liquidity. Um, so there's like two components to that question, which is one is like, once I have this inbound liquidity, like I need to make sure that it's shuffled around so that it's in, the, it's in good channels. And like, and remember people who are paying, they don't know exactly which channel has the correct liquidity. So they're going to hit one and then they're going to try another one and they're going to try another one. And then if too many of them fail, they're just going to give up on you. So if you can balance it around so that they always succeed, then you're going to do more routing. And that's, that's, that's also where fees come in because you can use kind of like the routing fees to justify the operational costs, like going to chain, creating new channels, buying channels, buying liquidity, like doing rebalances, that kind of thing. Yeah. A multi-channel rebalance feature has me thinking about AMP too. And so like sending... Yeah, well, that that's something that we that we recently also added to Lightning Loop, which is pretty exciting. Um, so, uh, one issue with doing a lot of liquidity changes on your Lightning node. So, like, let's say you have ten channels, and they all have like um, a Bitcoin each, and you want to um, you want that funds on chain. You want those ten Bitcoins. So, normally, what you would have to do is um, you would you would either close the channels. And you would you would take that ten bitcoins on chain, or you could do if in the past you could do ten lightning loops maybe, and each one of those lightning loops would be a payment, um, and then that would mean but that's still chain transactions because a lightning loop is separate. So it would still cost you some some money in chain fees even with the batching, um, but the thing that we have now with the multipath payments is that you can actually use those 10 channels as if they were one channel and pay and complete the payment to the um, to the Lightning Loop server who will send you back one on-chain HDLC. So we've taken 10, 10, 10 transactions that you would have to do with closing channels or you'd have to do with 10 loops, and we've turned it into one, one, uh, one transaction. Um, so that's like potentially a huge savings for people who are doing this like on the regular. Like, okay, I'm... I'm a merchant and I've just received in a hundred different channels and now I need to move that money to the exchange to, to buy more gift cards or something. So I can just do that in one operation that's saving me 10, hundred X on my chain fees. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Concept. Yeah. The condensing that from 10 channels to one or 10 transactions to one transaction on chain seems like a huge uh, burden reducer for users. And then would that help reduce just overall activity at the protocol level and help reduce the amount of transactions or well it helps kind of reinforce like the value of long-lived channels because mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a disruptive act to like close the channels and get your money out that way like now the other side has to like recreate the channel and they have to notice that they have to do that and there's a whole setup time um they have to pay the cost um it's it's nicer if we just have these like super long-lived channels it's like i have this relationship with you and you're not just tearing it down every time I'm successful at forwarding a lot of payments to you. The balance will reset. And um, we're, it's generating more traffic inside the Lightning Network. So uh, otherwise, it would just be one directional. Like people will pay to merchant, people will pay to merchant. And um, this way, the, 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 the volume kind of stays inside the Lightning Network because it, it also goes back the other way. Um, and in order for fees to come down on the Lightning Network, it, it actually, they kind of have to go up first. They have to be like, premium first, and then they can be downgraded once there's enough volume to justify going down. Um, so we have to make improvements on the technological side to reduce costs. 
but also just like the activity of kind of setting up the node and monitoring it and, you know, putting your funds on the line, all that stuff. Um, that kind of has to be justified with some volume. Otherwise, you're going to have to charge like a high premium rate. It's like if you make a luxury car, you have to put, you have to put a luxury price on it because you're not selling very many units. But if we can make this super commonplace, if we can make more and more volume in the Lightning Network, then you can have routers who can just deal in huge volumes and charge lower amounts. Yeah, getting there. What do you think we need to get there? These these hardware nodes that allow you to easily set this up out of the box, better education, combination of both. Like, is there? I think like a point. I mean, like, there's so many possibilities for how the network could take off. Um, but I think the most obvious one is that exchanges would use the Lightning Network to move between themselves, and not just the big exchanges, but also there's a whole like uh, galaxy of like little exchanges that you've never heard of that are just like they do they deal with you know in this one island nation or something they deal with the regulatory problems of buying how those people buy and sell bitcoin but how do they do arbitrage between you know the other like little town or little little city state or something who has their own exchange who has their own arbitrage um and th there's just hundreds of these guys and they're using the block space like the block space isn't currently being used by um you know, people buying coffee. It's by people making big trades and, you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands, millions of dollars. Um, so I think that's just the obvious solution of like, why don't these people are paying? I mean, even now the, the fees are way lower than they were before. Like before the median payment fee was going to be like $30. And now the highest is like $3, which still feels pretty high. Um, but that's working out to like $2,000 a minute. It's almost like reaching a billion dollars a year. So once you once you hit that, you you start to think like let's move some of this volume over to where it's cheaper, where I'm not having to spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars a month on chain fees. Yeah, does Bitfinex has been a, f a f first mover in this space? Get, they yeah, got for their sure. Lightning node up, uh, but yeah, a bit like Bitmax notoriously does a huge transaction every morning at like 9 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, and it's yeah. all about the network effect. Like if you just have one or two, it's not really helping that much. But if you have everybody on it then th this, there's really no, no question. Like, should I go to the chain or should I, you know, keep it off the chain? Well, everybody's on it. So I don't, I can just like always go off the chain. What do you think their apprehensions are today? You think they're just lazy or? <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of factors. I mean, even with like upgrades like SegWit, which are, are relatively straightforward um, and, you know, very well proven, like the highest standard and on the network for years, there's still lack of support for it. So I think that the, the exchanges are very focused on revenue generation and they're less focused on like technical, technical innovations. Like only certain exchanges really invest a lot into staying cutting edge with technology and um, really keeping up with all the best Bitcoin practices. Um, the other exchanges are more focused on like customer support and regulatory compliance. Um, so that's one reason why I think, it, of course, we would only see the support coming from certain exchanges because only certain exchanges are doing this like technical in integration. And it's kind of on us to like make make it easy for people who don't necessarily want to invest in, in, in innovation to just integrate this stuff. Yeah. And do you think it will get to a point where it'll be pretty easy to do within the next five years, maybe? I think so. And the, the, the other aspect is like what really motivates these exchange guys to to add stuff because they do add software they do change things up they add in because they want to make money really so if if you have to like if you have to ask them to like update their bitcoin library they're not going to do it because they don't see the dollars and cents but if you ask them to add some random coin and then you pay them they're going to do it immediately because that's going to that's how they make their money so uh, one interesting thing i think that the early adopters of lightning have been uh, experimenting with is actually making money on lightning themselves like becoming a liquidity provider so or becoming a routing node. Um, they just kind of see this as potentially there's some some ways to make money by just being by just leveraging some of the things that they already have. Like if you're an exchange, you already have like systems in place for how to deal with with Bitcoin security. You already have systems in place for how to monitor that and, and you already have to sit on Bitcoin because that's kind of like part of your business. So um, I think that's potentially a, a way that people could get moved on. Although there's also the counter argument, which is um, some exchanges have started to realize that like charging people on chain fees to withdraw is kind of good for their bottom line. They, they actually see that as like now a revenue stream. So 
if you go go and make it cheaper to go on chain, then you you lose kind of like this. You know, if if you're if you're an exchange that's charging people five dollars to withdraw, and you're just pocketing the difference, then um, you you know you, you don't want it to be too cheap sometimes. Yeah. So they're not just after the fact after transactions. They're just not sending a transaction and whatever the fee is, just taking that from the customers. They're actually making. Sure. And they also have the benefit of batching. So they, yeah, those are becoming pretty good revenue streams. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Is that messed up? Well, it's good and bad. I mean, the, the, one of the good sides about it actually is that it kind of discourages people from just over withdrawing. Like, uh, so, you know, it's, it's bad in the sense that like it encourages more people to keep their funds on a custodial exchange, but it's good in the sense that like, it's kind of a way to do batching. It's like, you should think twice about doing an on-chain transaction. Make sure you really need it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, especially after the last couple of weeks with, with fees going up a bit, especially during the week. Yeah. I've, I've certainly been thinking more about uh, sending on-chain fees. Yeah, I, on-chain I always wait, to, wait till the weekend because, like, can I wait? And that's a way that the, the market is supposed to decide what those fees are going to be. It's going to help, like, smooth that out. Yeah, I checked yesterday mempool my mempool is around like twelve thousand transactions right now it's at around eighteen thousand not too bad um but uh these dynamic that's what's like we could go down like so many more rabbit holes here at the lightning network specifically like so tour capacity versus public capacity uh private versus public channels how how much privacy uh, is afforded to users of the lightning network if they if they use it correctly well, I think that there's like two different modes of using Lightning. One is sending and the other one is receiving. So when you send, you have kind of like, there's kind of like an onion network already built into Lightning because you don't really pass along who's doing the sending. And that's already like a huge improvement over sending Bitcoin because right now when you send Bitcoin, people are monitoring the chain. They're looking at that global state to say, oh, who's this person? What are their coins related to? And unless you do a super good job of like separating out your wallets, um, you, you, you might be targeted. And they're doing other things like they're setting up fake Bitcoin nodes just to like triangulate your position. Um, so I think Lightning is doing a good job just like cutting out the number of people, even without Tor. With Tor, um, it's a bit better because potentially in the future, they could work backwards like where, where a payment came from by just like going and finding those node people and just saying, oh, where did you get this from? Um, and we could do other different algorithm changes to like make it uh, enhance the privacy by taking like circuitous routes or even trying to like prioritize Tor nodes. That's something that I, I made before um, to try to prioritize going through nodes that just can't easily be looked up. Um, receiving, I would say, is, is kind of the worst story in terms of privacy on Lightning right now because um, as a sender, um, your send gets wrapped in this onions. And so nobody knows like where it's coming from unless they go to the person each hop and then figure out where it came from. But as when it's, when you're, when you're receiving, you're telling other people, okay, here's how to get to me. And then every time you receive, um, generally you're using the same public key. And not only that, like, even if you create private channels, the private channels, um, for whatever reason include like the actual UTXO. So you're, you're also kind of revealing some of your, um, some of your on-chain coins to whoever you create an invoice and share an invoice with. Um, that's something that I think we can do better with in the future. We don't necessarily have to share those UTXOs, but that's not the, the best privacy story, even with Tor. Fascinating. It can get better though, correct? Yeah, there's no real reason that we have to share those um, on-chain markers. Um, the only reason that those are shared is because in public channels, we need to prove that you actually have channels. So we relate them to the blockchain to say, okay, these channels actually represent some Bitcoins on the blockchain. But for private channels where you just made it, you know, you don't have to share it with everybody. Um, all you really need is kind of some indicator between the peers, like, okay, use, you know, you use whatever channels you want. Like we don't care about it um, because it's private. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's a, uh, it seems that if architected correctly, it could be a very private way to use Bitcoin, um, but it seems like there's there's some some ways to go to get get pri- perfect privacy. But again, these things take time, right? And, and considering that, two years in, are you happy with the state of the Lightning Network? I mean, I, I feel like we could always do better, but um, I'm pretty happy with uh, like all the progress that has been made in terms of like 
making things more real. Like when I first started using the Lightning Network, I would I would turn on my node and it would crash every day. Like I would be at work at Bitco and I'd be like, okay, my, all my things just died because the node just crashed. And um, that's not like the the sexiest part of, of software is like just making it so that everything is reliable, but that is taking up all the time. It's like making sure that all the APIs work as, as you need them to, making sure that it's, it's rock solid in terms of like, it's uh, not losing data, it's not dying. Um, and I think we're, we're, things are light and day from when I first started using Lightning and, and now. I would agree for for me as well. It's, it's certainly become a better experience. In the beginning, it was even, I'm not the best connected node right now. My node's not incredibly connected, but it's connected enough where I only see like three loops and a transaction gets confirmed where a year, year and a half ago, that would something like a lot of my transactions should just not get routed. Yeah. I think liquidity is getting a bit smarter and we're also working on the path finding algorithm. Like it didn't used to be that it would ignore a node that wasn't doing a good job as a routing node. Um, so it would only follow one algorithm, which is let me try to find the cheapest possible route, but that can take forever. And then there's also a timeout on it. So it would just like fail. Um, so now it's more intelligent about how it makes that trade off. And there's way more that could be done on that. Yeah. It feels like it's happening. Like what's the developer interest like that you're seeing? Are you noticing more people come uh, and gravitate towards the protocol to help build it out? I think it's really, it's, it's a wave. It's, it's a wave system. Like the big challenge that lightning has is there's no like new token. So it's not like anybody's trying to pump their bags. I mean, unless their bags are Bitcoin, but this, it's not like, you know, the, the, the fund that the ICO can give to all these developers, it has to be organic. Like people have to actually like build businesses on this. Um, so I would say that the, there's waves of interest where it's like people say, oh, there's so much potential of what app I could build, what I could do. And then there's kind of a crest because it, it takes time for adoption. And, and the, the thing about a network effect is if you have a network that's very small, there's very little utility because you can't really interact with a lot of people. So you need to slowly build up that, that network, adding more and more people. And it's going to, just going to take time to grow that utility. utility. And it, it, you can't, we can't just airdrop that on everybody. No, you cannot airdrops are frowned upon around these parts. <laughs> Yeah. But it seems like, again, the game, uh, SATs getting integrated into games is very encouraging to me. Something like KeySend, where people are able to build these chat apps and you're sending P2P encrypted messages across the Lightning Network is mind-blowing to think that you could recreate a WePay, Alipay experience using the Lightning Network and completely flip the table on that where you're not having every transaction and message surveilled by the Chinese Communist Party instead you're just acting directly with the peers on the network that you're connected with that's that seems another like another groundbreaking uh, application in its own just key send yeah I think well monetizing any kind of like peer-to-peer -peer protocols like I always feel like that was a missing piece like um, we need to make it so that you can't just like and and that's that's why a lot of companies, back off of this idea that there would be like a uh, secure open communication standards. Like there used to be like this idea that like when Google talk like launch and Google was doing their messenger, they were like, this is going to be an XMPP standard and everybody's going to be able to, to use it. And it's all going to be encrypted and it's going to be great. And then they just had a lot of problem with spam with people, you know, connecting to other people. And they were like, why are we spending money on this? And that's just, this is a full-time job. So only like email made it over that hump where it's like so embedded that, companies kind of have to focus on spam and the spam is still an ongoing issue. Um, whereas all of our regular messaging has been siloed into these companies. Um, and those aren't, those aren't open standards that can benefit from peer review and end-to-end -end encryption and things like that. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's pretty revolutionary, isn't it? Like key send in itself, like, yeah, I think I think it's also it, it's it's still going back to like like originally in Bitcoin you could send a, like a message with your Bitcoin transaction. There was like a memo field in the like original Satoshi Nakamoto Bitcoin, and that was so natural. It's like I'm sending money to somebody, so I should be able to attach a little note on the message, and the message can be anything, even like a, you know machine readable data. So you could create protocols on it. But the thing is, 
and, and this is like in the early days of Bitcoin when you would like directly connect to people and like that's how you would transfer Bitcoin. You'd have to like connect to their node directly. Um, the, that was kind of dropped because it wasn't scalable, of course. But in Lightning, we can, we can recreate that same functionality, but it can be scalable now. Yeah. Is it scalable? A lot of people say. Uh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it's scalable say for um, beyond something that would be related to payments because the design is really focusing around payments. Um, but like, I wouldn't like stream a video over Lightning unless you really, like the, the Lightning network itself would kind of struggle with that. Um, but the, you know, in the future, maybe it could, um, once we, if we could get all the incentives like lined up, potentially you could just have that be a streaming movie that, that compensates everybody who's participating in the streaming movie. Um, I'd say at this stage, I would lower, I would set the expectations to be like sending a payment and it has a message that's already super powerful. No, I agree. I agree. And so I guess we can wrap it up with just a question on how much does a significant increase of on-chain fees affect uh, the potential scaling and, and increased usage of Lightning in the future? I think it has positive and negative effects on Lightning. I mean, the positive effect of, of the mempool getting full is that it really justifies uh, the investment and in making your channel, setting up your node. Because if, if you are just sending money around and the mempool is empty, you're spending maybe a penny with SegWit on, on these transactions. And so you're not really thinking about an investment in setting up channels, setting up a node, setting up Lightning, integrating that. If mempool is more consistently full, it makes more sense to really think about that. And the, the bad side of the mempool getting full is that we still have to improve the protocol to deal with fees. So it's it's easier to deal with the protocol when fees are more predictable and that they're low. And it's also easier for people to experiment with Lightning when it just costs very little to set up a channel. Um, it just lets lets people play around with different channels. Um, although it doesn't, it also doesn't encourage necessarily like the most efficient operation. And that kind of takes foresight. So like with Lightning Loop, we're like looking ahead of like when the mempool is full. Like how do we use Lightning and the blockchain most efficiently? And then LND itself has features like batch channel opening. So you can use one transaction to open up a channel to 10 different peers, 100 different peers. That's something that I've tried out. Um, and like we're kind of setting the groundwork for that future. Um, so that, uh, but it, it, it kind of requires a little bit of faith that the mempool will fill up to, to justify doing those things. Yeah. Is it wrong to envision a future where you could sort of construct a transaction on chain to set up a channel once certain parameters of the network are hit? Like average sat profile <laughs> is X. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm I'm just thinking on my ass or out yeah. of my ass here. You but you like, could definitely make some some kind of bots to switch over and like I think with Lightning Loop you could even kind of like. Um, still do on-chain transactions that you need to do, but, but fund it with Lightning and not even really be part of the Lightning network, but just like benefit from the batching of, of um, the Lightning loop, like pu pu putting your transactions together with other people. Um, and, then, and then you can kind of do like a cost comparison. You could say like, well, I'm spending down my pool that I reserve here. And um, you know, does it, is, is it worthwhile for me to like allocate more capital? There's just so many things you could do, but fees have to go up for people who really care about it. Yeah, it's a, that's a, like, again, it's a double-edged sword. I think it makes people care about it, but <laughs> well, the other thing is they should have cared earlier. The other thing is the more that people start caring, that actually also solves the problem, right? Like if people really use the blockchain more efficiently, it would cease becoming full and now you wouldn't care about it anymore. So you'd have kind of an oscillation effect where people would like all go and do batching, do SegWit, do lightning, and the mempool would basically, you know, be more efficiently used. And then it would go back and it would be like, oh, well, it's, it's more efficiently used, but we still have a lot of people using it. So it would kind of oscillate between those two phases. Yeah. Yeah. And, and potentially, you know, we could have chain, you know, we could have consensus changes. Like, you know, maybe the days of um, like efficiency are mostly over, but like, let's say Taproot and Schnorr is actually more chain efficient. Um, that could have impacts as well. Um, and there, there's plenty of other forks that could be done to um, improve the the on-chain efficiency. Agreed. And 
I really want to see DLC. I want, I want to see discrete log contracts come. So I'm hoping we get. Yeah, with Snore, which, I think that's that that should take off more. Yeah, and that whole concept, what, what the team at Short Bits is doing to really research and and create demos around uh, discrete log contracts makes me extremely excited about the future. That could be one of the killer use cases alone is smart contracting capabilities via the Lightning Network. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, Alex, our hour is done here. I know you're a busy man. You've oh. got a lot to do. Yeah, I think my Air- AirPods are dying. Yeah. <laughs> it was great to talk I to you. My... No, it was great to talk to you. We should do this again um, at some point. And I'm happy to say that I was able to to respond that I recognize half or fewer of the Lightning Network things huh. uh, of the tweet you just you just uh, sent out a few hours ago. Yeah, it's, it's pretty deep if you get into it. Yeah, I think I'm close to half. Like things like AZ sweeps, TLV, no idea what's going on there. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's the fact that there's this many different projects being worked on or aspects of the Lightning Network that people are thinking about is again infinitely encouraging and thank you for doing what you do to help build out this network and and educate people about why it's important and, and how you can use it uh, and efficiently and, and profitably yeah it's so fun i mean it's really a privilege to work on bitcoin cause, you know before i was just an enthusiast and now i work on it every day it's, it's kind of like a dream come true yeah um is there any parting notes final thoughts you want to want to leave the freaks out there before we wrap up um you know, I, I would definitely try out becoming a routing node. I think we need it to be more distributed. We need it to be just, you know, enthusiasts, activists, those type of people. And potentially there is a way to make money on it. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for kind of a new hobby, something to do while you're at home, I would I would try it out. Set up a lightning node, see if you can route some payments, try it out. You heard it here first. Get routing freaks. Uh, where can we find out more about you? Uh, well, I, yeah, you said I have the Twitter. Uh, um twitter alex bosworth and um i have a github as well i'm, I'm posting some like some demo code you know if you want to get started with making lightning apps um i posted some stuff from like what i worked on with the alt.org and um uh watch a lightning labs blog hell yeah check all that out freaks alex thank you again for your time really appreciate it hope you have uh an incredible afternoon and evening oh you too talk to you later Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Peace and love, freaks.